Good day, everyone. I'm your moderator, Lee Judge, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Building a Future-Ready Customer Service Experience, brought to you by Jakarta. As a note, to honor the privacy of our attendees, only your name will appear in the attendee window. In today's webinar, we'll be giving you a break from the day-to-day -day complexity of doing what you do, developing perfect customer experiences, and instead, we have Micah Solomon here to give us an informative and lighthearted view of what it takes to please your customers today and tomorrow. Micah Solomon is one of the world's leading authorities on customer service, company culture, the customer experience, and is a thought leader as well on entrepreneurship and innovation. The Financial Post has named Micah the new guru of customer service excellence. His books have been translated in more than half a dozen languages and are the recipients of multiple awards. A business leader and entrepreneur himself, Micah is a regular contributor to Forbes.com and has built his own company into a market leader in customer experience consulting. Uh, following the presentation, there will be a brief Q&A question and answer session, so please feel free to type your questions uh, in the Q&A window at any time during the event. Again, to honor the privacy of our attendees, only your name will appear in the attendee window. So let's begin. Micah, the presentation is all yours. Fantastic. Thank you, Lee. Do you remember this guy? Uh, some of you may only have seen him on the History Channel, but for years, this was a very successful marketing campaign. I think it was brilliant. Uh, this guy, I believe his name was Phil, was a character invented by the marketers for Maytag. And the idea was that if, if, if you were still, you were having the loneliest, saddest, most boring days possible because the Maytag dishwashers and washers and dryers, they never needed fixing. So this is clever marketing. The problem is that in today's world, it's much scarier than that for businesses. So if you were Maytag, for example, and this is just an example, if someone's looking to buy an appliance, I think they're much more likely to go to Facebook and see if the uh, We Love Maytag Facebook page has more activity or the Maytag Sucks page has more activity. So even though brilliant marketing is great, it needs to fit with the reality, with the customer experience that uh, is actually being enjoyed or otherwise by your customers. So I find this very scary a situation as a company, and I think many of you have as well. Customers are in charge. Customers know that they're in charge. Now, from time to time, it's very tempting to forget this. And I'd like to start out by reading an example from a company that did forget this. Now, I've changed the name of the company because, honestly, I think they've suffered enough. But other than the name change, this is how it appeared on Yelp. On March 3rd, I posted a restaurant review on this website. And seven days later, I was threatened with a lawsuit by an attorney representing Serenity Seafood Cafe for two unverified statements that I made. In order to peacefully resolve this matter, I am following the course of action the attorney has requested in the letter. I will retract my posting, the posting being replaced by the following retraction. And here's the retraction. In retrospect, I really should have said, to me, the line-caught rainbow trout tasted like farmed fish because it was almost flavorless. And it looked like farmed fish because it was the wrong color and crumbly. Perhaps it was indeed wild fish that had just spent too long in the freezer. And I should also have said pertaining to the chicken that, quote, this chicken seemed to me like frozen tenders because it was the size, shape, and texture of large pieces of solid plastic. So this poor business uh, got some bad advice from their lawyer they forgot that the customer was in charge, and it didn't work out very well for them. So knowing that the customer is in charge, I'm going to share three principles with you for pleasing customers today and tomorrow. Number one, the Jetsons test can help you decide what to make self-service versus where you should deploy human-delivered service. So the Jetsons was a show from 1963 that didn't run for very long, but it portrayed what they said was a world 
in 2063. Now you can say they didn't get a lot of things right. First of all, everyone is white in the show. It's very sexist. People still smoke. So a lot of things are not correct. However, as far as the customer experience and technology, they came really, really close. And the reason they were able to get close was because they had hired a bunch of futurists to help them predict what things might be like in the future. So here are some of the things that are true on the Jetsons show. Um, much of the customer experience is provided by machines. Secretaries don't take dictation. Instead, callers leave their message on. And listen, here they got it almost right, a rewritable vinyl LP. So they predicted everything except digital. Everything except digital. Sorry about that. Self-service push-button breakfast was how you would get your, um, your meal in the morning, if you, particularly if you were in a hurry. The chores around the house were taken care of by Rosie the Robot. Now, I don't know about you, but we have that here in the Solomon household. We have uh, iRobot, the little, uh, the little robotic um, floor mopping machine. So even Rosie has come true. And it's, we're even not very close to 2063 right now. But there are humans on the show, and there are humans who provide service. So what do they provide? Well, they usually provide warmth and some friendly engagement. So there's the friendly southern accented receptionist. There's Henry, who I've pictured here. He is the superintendent for um, their uh, skyscraper. He does some handiwork, but mostly he's a buddy to the family and he finds solutions to problems, like if they lose their dog, Astro. There's occasional cab drivers. No, they didn't predict Uber. But there's occasional cab drivers and such who provide human interaction and laughs. Now, the reason I'm talking about the Jetson set test is that I believe it provides a useful and amusing way to divide the customer experience. So if the service in question can be delivered more efficiently, via automation or self-service, offer it that way. At least give your customers that option. If the service in question requires or benefits from human warmth, have humans deliver it. And when they do, have them do their best, warmest, most spectacular job. Now, the exceptions to point one and two are when warmth comes at the expense of efficiency or vice versa. And when that happens, it's a judgment call. And we'll go over how to deal with that. So here are some examples where the company decided, based on the Jetsons uh, framework, that humans were required. And a good example of this is the My Lowe's um, feature on the, on the Lowe's app. So you can retrieve your warranty info. You can get tips for using items that you've purchased. You can reorder items that you've purchased before. And, and this is clever, you can buy complementary with an E uh, products. So uh, you bought this drill, but you need to know which drill bits, which is better than, I think for a lot of people, it's better than walking into a store and telling some 14.5 year old who works there, uh, do you remember that power drill I bought 18 months ago? I need a screwdriver attachment that will fit it. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't bring it with me and have them try to figure out what you're talking about you can take some control of the experience yourself. Domino's used to have an entirely analog uh, experience where they would guarantee that your pizza would arrive within 30 minutes or less. Now the problem with this was who drives for Domino's? Generally teenagers, generally male teenagers, the absolute worst demographic for uh, safety. And so you're a teen, you've bought that bitchin' new Camaro, and you need the, you need help with the payment. So you apply for a job with pizza, sorry, with, with Domino's. And your, your boss tells you, well, you have only 12 minutes left on the clock. You only have 12 minutes left on the clock. You have to get it there or you're fired. So they drive off real fast straight into the nearest tree or even worse than nearest pedestrian. Well, this happened enough that Domino's decided to kill their 30-minute delivery. 
but they came up with something which I think makes more sense now. So it's the Domino's Pizza app, and you can get almost too much uh, information, almost, about the, the state of your job. So you start with um, the order placed, then you can see it's in prep, then it's baking, then it's in the uh, optimistically named quality check stage, and then most importantly, it's out for delivery because I don't know, I order a lot of pizza. And if you're like me, you don't care so much if it shows up in 30 minutes or 35 minutes or 25 minutes. What you care is that you'll have your clothes on when that doorbell rings. So as long as you know, quite specifically when it's out for delivery, you can adjust your schedule and your wardrobe uh, for when the pizza is going to arrive. So I think this is smart. No humans were required for this. Now, this one, Air New Zealand, took a process that is often self-service. Uh, those of you who are fortunate enough to fly business class uh, overseas, internationally, usually setting up the bed in the, in the stay, lay flat seats is done on a self-service basis. Uh, but Air New Zealand said, well, you know what? We're going to make it so you need assistance. So they add this human touch. It's an unusual approach, but it works for them. I like this example maybe the most because the customer is deciding which side of the Jetsons experience it should fall, whether it should be self-service or human-assisted. So this is from Jakarta, and the self-service side of this they describe as visual IVR. And you can look, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but but look at the, um, the second screen, you're selecting the option and everything's very visual. This contrasts, I think, pretty well with the typical use of an IVR where it's press one for billing, press two for technical assistance. It's a little better, I think, for most customers, <laughs> assuming you're not driving, uh, in which case you shouldn't be pressing the one or two either, I would argue. But, uh, for most customers, it's going to work better to see this all on their smartphone screen. But if that's not working for you, at every step, you can get the agent assistance. And as the uh, coup de gras, the agent is able to see everything that you're seeing on your screen as well. So this is letting the customer decide. Point number two, customers want an eye-level, peer-on-peer, authentic style of service. And I put authentic in quotes because you do have to rise to the occasion when you're doing customer service. If you have a hangover or a terrible headache, customer wants you to rise above that. But they do like authenticity. They like you being you. Here's a quote from a long interview I did with a millennial customer. Millennials are uh, are there people who were born approximately 1980 to 2000. So this is a millennial customer, a younger customer, and here's the quote from her. The kind of customer service I enjoy is mutually respectful when a service or sales employee seems on a par with me, and we enjoy each other as a result. So I said, well, what do you mean by on a par? What does that mean? She said she thought she meant that we are social equivalents, even though in this particular particular moment they are serving me, and in this particular moment I am being served, she understood that she could be on the other foot. So scripted service, uh, very rigid service provided by employees who are not empowered to do anything for you until they ask a manager, that I feel is obsolete, at least at the best companies. This might be my favorite example of a live chat. This is from Amazon. I'm in Seattle. I can wave to Amazon from here. But in fact, the, um, the gentleman who did this chat, I asked him about it because this is so spectacular. He was new on the job. He was in their Cape Town, South Africa contact center. And his actual honest-to-goodness name is Thor. So Thor from Norse mythology. So he says, greetings. I'm sorry, he says, warmest greetings, my name is Thor. The customer jumps right in and says, greetings, Thor, can I be Odin? Now, Odin is uh, Thor's father in Norse mythology, and, and Thor, instead of, being, instead of not playing along, which is what would happen 
with script inserts, he plays along immediately. Odin, father, how art thy doing on this here fine day? And the customer comes back, Thor, my son, agony raises upon my life. Amazon Thor says, this is outrageous. Who dares defy the all-father Odin? What has occurred to cause this agony? And the customer says, I am afraid the book I ordered to defeat our enemies has been misplaced. How can we keep Valhalla intact without our sacred book? And it goes on. It goes on for just a little bit. My Amazon says, allow me some time to round up my allies and complete this, please, Father. And the customer says, do it for me, Thor, but most importantly, do it for the mortals whose destiny and grades rely upon this book. So this is a little over the top. This only works for the customer who has time for this, but the customer in question greatly enjoyed it. If you get to the end of the chat, he talks about how this has really bonded him to Amazon customer service, and so um, I think it, it served its purpose. Point number three is chocolate tastes better when it's shared, and I will prove that in a second. Chocolate tastes better when it's shared, when more, one or more people are eating chocolate. The same is true for the customer experience. So I didn't just make this up. Um, I didn't make this up so that I could try to bum some, some chocolate off of someone who's nearby me. This comes from the Yale School of Psychology, who very easily were able to round up some human volunteers to eat chocolate. And either you could eat chocolate in isolation or you could eat it near another person. And it turned out that even if you didn't share your chocolate, if you were just eating it in the same room with someone else, it made it taste better. They individually interviewed the one person and the other, and if they were eating it near someone else, it made it taste better, which makes me want to be, I'm not sure a psychologist, but at least the subject of an experiment. So here's an example for retail of this principle. So millennials aren't always comfortable talking with sales staff, but they do a lot of screen sharing in their, in their real life, right? Not in the commercial world, but in their real life, they do a lot of, hey, look at this. So in clienteling, which is retail speak for what we might call a personal shopper, um, the, the personal shopper can say, this is cute, isn't it? And hand the customer the tablet. The customer says, yes, let's add this to my closet. The closet is a part of the app which um, st temporarily stores the clothes that they hopefully are going to buy. So then you're very close to having made the sale. Now, why do customers share? One reason is what I like to call social status. So in the old days, like what you would see on Mad Men, um, marketers would develop these status steps. First, you had a Chevy, then they would try to move you into Cadillac, or if you had a Ford, they would try to move you into Lincoln. But for today's shoppers, status is not necessarily achieved by having, having visible possessions. It's much more collecting and then sharing experiences. So, you know, yesterday I probably purchased something, but it wasn't necessarily what I shared. What I shared was there was a big rainbow over the Puget Sound, and I shared a picture of that. So if your brand can facilitate uh, having a great experience and making it easy to share, then you make it more likely that I will share that experience rather than a totally non-commercial picture, in this case, of the rainbow. So if it's not on my phone, it didn't happen. Every millennial everywhere would agree on this. And it's not just millennials. There is actually, you can check this out yourself, there's actually a group on Facebook called My Life's Officially Over. My parents have joined Facebook. So it's spreading upward age-wise to all generations. Uh, there was a, the New Yorker, which has a somewhat older demographic reading it, published a cartoon not too long ago where the waiter's coming up to the station, uh, to the table and saying, excuse me, is there anything wrong with your meal? We've noticed that you haven't photographed it yet. So, so it's every demographic at this point. So what do you do about this? Well, build the sharing and the photography into the experience to whatever extent you can. Uh, Warby Parker is an online and in-person uh, optometrist. And what one of the things that distinguishes them is the social aspect. 
whether you're online or in the store, you can try on frames. I'm wearing a pair right now, believe it or not. You're just going to have to trust me on that. Try on the frames. Take pictures of them, or in, in online it uses their functionality uh, it, to take a picture of it. Share it socially and get real-time reactions and votes from your friends and family, and then you can choose what they, um, what your friends and family thought looked best on you. Drybar is this um, company that's spreading all over the country, and they've also opened up in London as well, where all they do is... Um, style your hair. Um, they blow dry your hair. That's it. But they've made it such an experience, such an experience um, that uh, it's something you might want to share. And to make sure you actually share it, there's a VIP section on their Facebook page where if your blowout is rated highly by people on Facebook, you get to be a celebrity for that week. Or Nordstrom, which we consider a very traditional example of a great customer experience, actually is very innovative. And in the Nordstrom app, there's a part called dressing room, similar to the um, closet that I showed you earlier, a dressing room section. So you put things on, quote unquote, put things on in a dressing room, and then you share it with your friends and get their opinions of what you should buy. Do your buns look good on Instagram? I probably don't know the answer to that unless you're Kim Kardashian. So I am asking about a different kind of buns. I am actually actually asking about this kind of bun, a burger bun at Chili's. And Chili's felt that their buns were not photogenic enough. They felt they tasted great, but they didn't look great. So they put what they promise is a flavorless, non-toxic coating on their hamburger buns uh, to make it look better on Instagram. They spent, I kid you not, a hundred thousand dollars on it and they think it is money well spent because then their audience advertises them. So not super clear from this picture how it works, but this one I think um, is pretty clear. So this is how the wings at Chili's traditionally looked. It's a nice kind of old-timey wax paper look. I think it's fine, but it doesn't. You can see this photograph looks a little messy. So they spent um, a, an untold amount of money on making it look more like this. And this is an actual person photographed it. And it looks great, I think. They have the um, stainless, brushed stainless steel look for the, you know, it's the same wings, but it, it photographs better. So this is what matters if you want this 100% free advertising from the people enjoying, hopefully enjoying your customer experience. Here's a fabulous example from a hotel. This is the 1888 Hotel in Sydney, Australia. If you're listening, I have not visited this personally, and I think it's important that I do, but I, I have seen a lot about this hotel, and it's colloquially known as the um, Instagram Hotel because they set up all these great recommended Instagram experiences, and uh, they make the rooms and the lobby also look very photogenic, very photogenic, so people will hopefully have an experience there and photograph it. And in case you might miss the point, they put this gigantic rustic frame in the lobby, so you can take the picture there. Now, I'm going to recap, and on this last point, I don't want to overstress the visual example. You can have a company like Zappos where they do spectacular things for their customers. And it's not necessarily visual, but it's so spectacular that customers want to share it, and that matters as well. So I always was scared of recaps in presentations because we have a customer at our business who is uh, the fantastic comedian Margaret Cho. And in her routine, she talks about how her mom will leave these long messages on voicemail, 20-minute message on voicemail. And then she'll say, to recap, and she'll talk for another 10 minutes. Well, this recap is really, really short, and that is my dog, Potter, who uh, <laughs> he doesn't look very happy, who posed for this recap slide. So number one, sorry, Potter, the Jetsons test can help you decide what to make self-service versus where to deploy human-delivered service. And in the example from Jakarta, there's also another choice. 
where you can let the human themselves decide which choice to make. Number two, customers want an eye level, peer on peer, authentic style of service, rather than what you might call the gray poupon method of service, where you are elevated and the customer is not. So, um, or you can think about it the other way, where the employee is very servile and you are the king, the customer. So they want a more level experience, a level experience to some extent. And number three, chocolate tastes better when it's shared. And the same is true as well for the customer experience. If you can make an experience that your customers or your prospective customers want to share, they will do your marketing for you. The good news here is that the lifetime network value of customers today is unprecedented. So the metric people used to use was lifetime customer value, how much one customer might spend in their lifetime. But I would argue that an even better metric is their, their network value, how much they will share about you. And today, more than ever, they are going to share about your company. Just make sure it's something good. Thank you guys so much for lis listening. It is really a treat to be here with you. All right. Well, thank you, Maki, for your valuable and entertaining insights on building a future-ready customer experience. Uh, due to the high participation in the webinar, we're going to answer uh, three or four questions and then let you uh, get back to your busy day, as we promised. Uh, you can also uh, add some questions to the Q&A window and additional ones, uh, additional questions. Uh, so, Mike, I'm going to pick a couple of questions from there now and ask, and uh, then you can fire away. Uh, the first question here says, what are some other customer experience trends you are seeing emerging currently? Emerging currently, so self-service as an option is huge. I would say uh, the customers more and more don't want to have to call you for what I call stupid stuff, or if I need better, I might use a different S word, stupid stuff, let's just say. So they don't want to call you just because you didn't put your physical address on your website. They don't want to call you because, uh, well, especially not because Google uh, listed your hours wrong and they don't want to call you once they're at your front door to figure out why um, it's, you're not open. They, they don't want to call you because you're frequently asked questions or just something that your web designer slapped up and they don't really cover all of the questions that you need answered. So self-service and intelligent self-service, I think, is a huge trend. Um, different types of customer support, visual, the Jakarta example is an excellent one, but some forward-thinking companies are also using a lot of um, text-based or messaging-based service, and I think that's a big one as well. Uh, what's called first-channel resolution is, is important doing what you can to not require a customer to leave the channel that they're, they're uh, comfortable with. A lot of times, uh, customers these days are going to tweet something about your company uh, trying to get a response. Uh, recent, up till recently, you kind of had to ask them to call you or at least direct message you. But now um, there are private ways to address this where the customer can still stay in the channel that they started with, even if you're in a regulated environment. Okay. Uh, one of the questions I'm going to pull here from the Q&A window, um, they ask, how do we promote the self-help among the customers? Well, that's an excellent question. I think that you don't push it too hard. If it's going to catch on, it's going to catch on. So one place where it has caught on, uh, T-Mobile did a huge rollout uh, powered by live person and they did it this summer and all they did was put on their app not just the call me button but the message me button and of course it's all magenta because it's t-mobile so in magenta you were invited to um, have them message you and it was well designed enough that a very large percentage of people who tried it once wanted to try it again uh, if you're promoting it and people don't want to use it then uh, you've got an issue and you might not want to push it too hard. All right. I'm going to combine a few similar questions here. Um, the next one, similar to the last one you spoke on, actually, you can expand on it. It says, uh, can you talk more about self-service and how it can go right or go wrong? 
Well, excellent. I think that is actually a really good question. So intelligent self-service means it's designed from the customer's perspective, which is not easy to pull up, both in uh, human delivered service and in the customer experience. It's hard to get it from a customer point of view. And the, the reason it's hard is because you know so much about your company. You know how things sh uh, work and how they should work. This is the curse of knowledge, it's called. You know way too much about it. So to dumb it down actually means you need to be very intelligent uh, in eliminating jargon, eliminating things which are based on having too much knowledge of your customer. So this is both a customer experience question and what's called a user experience question. They're slightly different things, but it, it requires discipline. And I also would argue that it benefits from requiring people at your company to stop using your memorized logins, to stop using their special shortcuts to get into your retail-facing website. They should have to suffer through it the same way the public does so that you get feedback from your actual staff when it's not intuitive, not easy to use. Okay, excellent. This next question uh, refers to earlier when you mentioned that uh, the idea of being unscripted. So their question is, does that vary in ap ap applicability by industry? Exactly, it, it does. It does vary, and I'm glad someone brought that up. So the exceptions to my don't script uh, rule, uh, they come when something is safety related. Safety related, for example, uh, mail order pharmacies that deal with injectables for people with diabetes, MS, and so forth. It's important that the person on the phone go through the script, ask, do you have any questions for the pharmacist? Have you experienced any new side effects? These things are important. So that those are the exceptions. There are also exceptions which aren't necessarily driven by safety, but are driven by regulation. So if I told a banking organization, a retail bank or otherwise, that you don't follow a script, that would be wrong because they do need to ask the questions and make the disclosures which are required by regulation. Excellent question. All right. Well, uh, we're going to wrap things up here with one more, one last question. Uh, again, about the industries. We have many different varying industries on the call right now. So uh, the question that's asked is, is very pertinent. Uh, they ask, are certain industries getting customer service more than others? Well, yeah, absolutely they are. Uh, I'm not sure how how many people I can offend with one answer, but um, <laughs> but let's just talk traditionally. So um, if you have a question about your particular uh, industry, feel free to write to me. Uh, as long as you successfully spell both my first and last name, you will reach me. Uh, my last name's all O's, my first name's M-I-C-A-H, so it's Micah at MicahSolomon.com. But talking in very broad strokes, I would say the hospitality industry is best known for service. And the reason for this is, if, if we think about it, there's nothing that's more of a commodity than a hotel room. Uh, it's rectangular. The toilet probably works. The door probably locks successfully. So it's infusing that with life by being hospitable. It's built right into their name. So they're probably doing the best, whether it is in uh, lodging or in what's called food and beverage. So even uh, you don't have to spend a large amount to um, – you know, you can spend four dollars and fifty cents on your latte and see how well customer service is usually handled at Starbucks. I know you all have your exceptions, but by and large, um, businesses that have traditionally been laggards are um, banking and sometimes business-to-business -business companies that feel that they don't have to be at the same high standard as um, business-to-consumer. But again, these are very broad strokes. There's a bank right near me called Umpqua Bank, which is famous for being the Ritz-Carlton of retail banks. I mean, that's almost exactly how they position themselves. And they strive to live up to that. So uh, it varies by industry, but it also varies a lot by business. And um, there you go. There's great business to, uh, business to business companies as well. 
uh, non-retail companies as well. But those are some very broad strokes. All right, excellent. Well, this concludes our webinar today on building a future-ready customer service experience. Thanks again to our esteemed speaker, Micah Solomon. If there are any questions that we were unable to answer during today's session, well, Micah's uh, information is on the screen right now. You can get that. Uh, and Jakarta or Michael, Micah can just, uh, directly respond to you after the event. We hope that you gained valuable insight into the future of customer service, and you can utilize that to enhance your organization's customer service. A replay of the event will be available soon on Jakarta.com, along with a download link to the presentation. Thank you again for attending today. Please visit us again at Jakarta.com, and have a wonderful day.